Well, it's that time again. Open your Bibles. <laughs> if you'd open with me to Second Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 9 through 21 this morning. Second Timothy chapter 4, 9 through 21. And this is going to conclude our study through Second Timothy as well as through the pastoral epistles, uh, which are Paul's letters to Timothy and to Titus. Second Timothy, as you know, is, is Paul's, it's his final letter to the church. This is, his, excuse me, this is his swan song. Um, and in the forefront in writing this letter is Paul's charge to Timothy to persevere in his call and face the perilous times. And in the face of apostate teaching and apo- their apostate followers in the face of the persecution that's happening at the hands of Nero and all this stuff, just difficult times, perilous times that are falling upon uh, the church. And, and as we finish up second Timothy, we read last week in verses five and six of chapter four, where Paul said, as for you, Timothy, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand has come. And so we know that Paul is in Rome at this point, he's in prison and he is expected to die. He's about to die. Church history uh, leans towards that ending where he is about to die. And so um, he says there to Timothy in verse nine, do your best to come to me. And we know that Paul absolutely loved Timothy. Timothy was his right hand man. Paul is writing in first and second Timothy to encourage him to tell him he he seemed to have a little bit of a spirit of timidity in him. You need to be encouraged a lot. How many of you are like that? You're easily kind of, you know, God's called you to something, but oh Lord, help me every step of the way, every moment you kind of back away from it and you have to be pushed forward and encouraged. Well, that was seemed to be Timothy. For all his gifts and all his calling, uh, he was he was someone who needed a lot of encouragement, which is what Paul is doing constantly in his life. He's encouraging him. And Paul and Timothy was someone he called his beloved son. He called him his true child in the faith. He called him a lot of things. And so it was in his final days in Paul's final days that he wants Timothy by his side. And just by way of review, um, in Paul's letter to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter two, verses 20 through 24, he says of Timothy to them, cause he's going to send them to him. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus, starting in verse 19, actually says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And I hope therefore to send him to you as soon as I see how it will go with, go with me. And I trust the Lord. I, I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come to you. And so Paul's saying, listen, the best thing that you can have is Timothy in your, in your, in your fellowship. Um, I, if I can't be there, man, Timothy is my own heart beating outside my chest. And so for all Timothy's frailties, he was beloved by Paul and trusted. And Paul wanted Timothy to come to him as soon as possible as he's facing death. But we find out the reason for Paul's urgency. It wasn't just for death. Uh, obviously that's a, that's a big issue, but verse 10, he says, why? He says for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You know, what's devastating in life and in the life of the church and a ministry is, is, is betrayal by those you've entrusted precious to things too. This is something that is a reoccurring theme in scripture. And we see that disciples uh, desert their call all the time. Followers of Jesus, quote unquote, uh, follow, uh, desert their call to follow the Lord a lot. You know, Jesus in John six, and you can read that it's a pretty devastating chapter. He starts speaking about himself as being the bread of life. He had just done this miracle. He fed everybody and they go, man, well, this guy can give us free food. Let's follow him. Well, Jesus says, well, just as I gave you this food, I will give you eternal life. It was an analogy, something physical to point to spiritual, but they didn't want the physical. They wanted the spirit. I mean, they didn't want the spiritual. They wanted the physical. They couldn't get over it because he started saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. 
He starts talking himself as the man who came down from heaven and all this type of stuff, and they wouldn't have it. And as you fast forward in John 6, 66, it says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. 67 says, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Well, good old Simon Peter. He answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy one of God. And Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, tw- you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. I mean, Jesus does. He doesn't even, he just keeps pressing in on the fact that there are those among, even in the inner circle who will not persevere, who will not follow. So one of you is a devil. That's heavy words. And he spoke, verse 71, of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And we know that Judas is the archetype for those who do not persevere, who do not follow, who do not believe, who are Christians in name only. But when it comes down to it, their love is not with the Lord. It's in the world. And that's what was going on there. We know that Jesus was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew that Peter loved, uh, not Peter, that, that Judas loved money. And he was the one in charge of the money, the money handler there. And so Paul has already mentioned many who have betrayed the faith in the previous chapters, but now he mentions Demas Demas is, is first mentioned in Colossians, uh, which was written sometime between the five years between first and second Timothy. There's five years between first and second Timothy. That's why we did first Timothy, Titus, second Timothy. There's a lot's going on there, but Demas was in the ministry. He was following along. He was helping. He was with Paul. He was doing all these things. And at the end of Paul's letter in Philemon, he, he's even in there it, where it says in verse 24, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke are all, all called fellow workers with Paul. So he's in the group. But here at the end, Paul says that Demas deserted him and went to Thessalonica. Now that word deserted is interesting. MacArthur points out it means to utterly abandon and leave someone in, this, in a dire situation. And that's what happened. And the reason Demas abandoned Paul, although we don't know how have the specifics, is that Demas was what? He was in love. Oh, love. He was in love with this present world. That's what's going on is he was in love with this present world. Paul just said, and we went over last week, that Timmy, there's going to be perilous times because there's going to be people who pop up in the church who are lovers of self. And he goes on and goes, they're, 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 they follow their passions. They're lovers of passion, not lovers of God. And he puts these, those are the bookends. And then in there is like lovers of money and boastful, proud, arrogant, and keeps on going through all these types of things that manifest that love of self. John in, in first John two fifteen says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. Demas did not persevere. He did not fulfill his ministry because his affections were not with the Lord. They were with the world. Demas loved this present world. Guess what word is used there? The Greek word for love there for loving this present world. I know. Come on. Greek words. Come on. Let's go. Agape. The only one we know, right? Yeah. Agape. It's not a brotherly love. It's a sacrificial love. An unconditional sacrificial love where you are willing to sacrifice for the sake of something else. It's ironic. And I think it's purposeful that he's using this word. What happened is Demas was in love with the world and he was willing to sacrifice everything that was close and around him so that that one thing would be his. He sacrificed Paul. He sacrificed his ministry, his calling, his friends, the church, and he abandoned all of that. And he went towards what was in his heart and he went away from that. And he went to a place that was easy. He left Rome, which was difficult, went to Thessalonica. 
How many of us have wanted to go to Thessalonica? Anybody else? And, and really, this is what ultimately demonstrates the evidence of being a believer or non-believer. We all fail, and we'll get to that, but the evidence of being a believer or non-believer is where our love is. This is what Jesus called out to the church in Ephesus, if you remember, in Revelation. He said, you know, you've done all these great things, but I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen, repent and redo those first works. Come back to me. Am I your first love still church? Hey, remember the church is about me. This is the problem with Israel. Israel had all the worship service down and all the things that were going on. But when it came time for them to recognize the one it all pointed to, he was, Jesus was outside Jerusalem, looking in on Jerusalem, weeping. Said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he wept over them. How I long to gather you, but you missed me. You missed me. May we not miss Jesus. May we not be in love with the world. Or may we be a lover of Jesus, but lest we take this lightly when people tried to follow Jesus. I know the church has a big giant open door. Come on in. Come on in. We want you to come in. Yay. It's a full house. Therefore equals spirituality. This is what Jesus said. You want to follow me? People go, Hey, I want to follow you. Oh, we'll just take this class and you're in Luke 14, 25. Jesus wanted to clear up with anyone deciding to follow him. I've got to be your first love. Luke 14, 25 through 33. Jesus called anyone who wanted to follow him to count the cost first. Let me read Luke 14, beginning of verse 25. It says now great crowds accompanied him. Got the numbers. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's the seeker friendly church there. It's a joke. Not very seeker friendly. You've got to hate those things that are precious to you. Seems like on the surface in order for you to come to me, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost. You want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. Jesus says you must count the cost. I must count the cost. And this is the cost. He keeps on going. You got to count the cost. He says, who doesn't, if you're going to build something, if you're going to build a tower, doesn't sit down and first count the cost, whether it has enough to complete it, to persevere, to finish. What does he say? Otherwise, when it has laid the foundation, it is not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goes out to encounter another king in a war who will not sit down first to deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet one who comes against him with 20,000. Okay, I won't comment there. But if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. And so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. In Matthew 8, 19 to 22, it says, and a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. He's a scribe. He's a lawyer. He's well educated. And, and, you know, he was probably an upright man from what we see in a lot of things. But Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds have of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you willing to give up and follow me? Cause I'm not going to have a house. I'm going to be wandering on the hillsides around the valleys. I'm going to be going from town to town. This is my life. Are you really wanting to follow me into the difficulties that I'm headed into? And, and another one of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus, verse 22, said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Those are hard words. How many of you love your parents? And you say, I want to follow Jesus. And you say, well, let me first go take care of my family needs. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their de- the dead. You come follow me. How does that come across to you? Well, that's unloving and insensitive. 
Think Jesus is making a point to the rich young ruler who came up to Jesus again. What did he say to him? Give everything up to the all, give them all to the poor and follow me. Listen, loving this present world isn't always manifested in grievous sins, right? The ones we like to pop up there, not saying they're not grievous, but loving this world can be about loving parents above loving Christ. It can be about prioritizing children over Christ. It can be about loving a spouse above Christ, about love of a job or a pursuit of your career above Christ, love of fill in the blank of love above Christ. And now, obviously, when Jesus says you must hate these various things, he is not calling you to hate these people. He's using extreme language to say that I am not going to be second place. And the very things that are earthly loves, even God given earthly loves can become idolatrous in your life and block you from finding the Lord block you from following me. Because what happens is when you actually then come to the Lord and he is first, he turns you around and gives, fills you with his love. And then what does he say? Now go love (laughs) one another, but you can't do it the other way around. Or think you can't love for earthly things above earthly uh, above Christ is idolatry. No matter how we slice it to where we can love our parents at the expense of following God. Doesn't that sound ironic? It's not saying we don't, how much, but then to not love your parents is not obeying God, right? So what's first? Love God and you'll love your parents. We can love our kids at the expense of prioritizing uh, them over the priorities of God. And we're all guilty of this as parents. How many of us can say, yep. We can love money or in things or self and all these that are often real blessings in our lives, aren't they? But if they get out of place, if they become first, they keep us from following him. And Jesus says, I got to be number one. And this is why he came back to Ephesus and said to them, you've left your first love. Come back to me. Make me number one again. Let me make me one number one. You got to count the cost. Leave all that is submit him to the Lord Jesus. And follow him. Now we don't know Demas' specifics. It just, Paul just lays out. He loved this present world. He didn't say what he's in love with, but he just had an agape for this present world. And if we had to guess the guess that I would have, and this is speculation is that abandoning, he abandoned the ministry to preserve self. It got heated in Rome and he decided he wasn't going to do it. And so Demas was someone who started out strong He started out strong and did not finish. We know the parable of the seed that was scattered. It landed on the ground. It was, it was, this had rocky ground. It was received with joy. But when persecution came, it did not have root. It did not continue. And that's what would happen with Demas. He left Rome to pursue that love for this present world. And now Paul is calling his son in the faith, Timothy to come pick up the critical ministry that Demas left in pieces. And that's what's going on. Now, lest we get too bummed, not everyone abandoned Paul. There are others who are faithful in the ministry. Amen. So that's like the cautionary tale. And may the Lord speak to our hearts on that. Lord, ah, you know, and the Holy Spirit will do that work, right? Respond to him in that. But don't get too bummed because we got verse 10. We've got Crescens has gone to Galatia. These are great baby names. If anybody's looking for baby names, a lot of them (laughs) just keep on. You're going to laugh as we go through this list. I'm telling you, they got to make a comeback. But we really don't know who Crescens was, but, um, but <laughs> what we see here that he was faithful to go to Galatia or Gaul as some of your places He's back to Asia Minor. And what you're going to see is that Paul had people abandon him uh, in Asia 
And we're going to read about that. And then he's sending these faithful ministers back to replace all these people who had left. That's kind of what's happening there. So they were with him in Rome. Then he sends them out. And so we have Crescens there. Then Titus, we know about Titus. He was last in Crete, right? And then he went on to, uh, at the end of, of, at the end of the uh, Titus's book there, uh, uh, Paul's letter to Titus, he tells him to go to somewhere else. He tells him to go to Nicopolis and then on his way to see me. So there's some other places he went. So Titus is faithful. Amen. Still in the game. Uh, and then we find out that what happened is Paul's sending these people out. But verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Now, Luke is the writer of Acts. He's the writer of the book of Luke, if you did not know that. And what's really awesome is that you've, you, if you're following on in the book of Acts, you see Luke is saying, and we went and we went here and we went there and we went there. And then it says, and then he went because they separated ways. And then it comes back a little bit. And he's like, and we went. And so Luke has been faithfully with Paul through much of his ministry journey. And, he, and the point here is that Paul's in a dungeon and Luke alone is there. And he's a doctor. He's a physician. We don't know if he's a full on minister or whatever it is, but there was a great need for Timothy to come back and help with the church in Rome and help Paul. He doesn't have email. You know, he's not Twitter and array or creating TikTok videos in the dungeon. He's stuck like in really bad situations and he doesn't have much paper. This is heavy and he's going to die. And so you have, this is ironic. You have an unfaithful Demas. You have the faithful Crescens and Titus and Luke. And now a big surprise if you can catch it in other places, but check this out. And then in verse 11, Paul says next to Timothy 11, Hey, get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful for me, for to me for ministry. You're like, okay, now if you don't know about Mark or what we're talking about, John Mark, this is an awesome story of redemption. We love this story. So John Mark is probably, well, we know he's a native of, of Jerusalem. His, his uncle is Barnabas. And so they probably own land there in Jerusalem. And this is, they probably own the room, the upper room where they all met together. And it was probably John Mark. Many think that is John Mark who, when Jesus was arrested, he was a young guy who just had a cloak and the Romans were grabbing him and they grabbed the cloak and he ran away naked. It's John Mark, right? So he runs, he likes to run. We know that. And then what we find out, <laughs> yeah, is from Acts 15 is that Mark had abandoned Barnabas and Paul on one of their early journeys. Barnabas and Paul are going and, and Barnabas saw, let's bring my nephew. And they're like, okay, okay, come on along in the ride. And then he gets, and it gets hard and he leaves, he bails. And so they get back, they regroup after coming back down from Jerusalem in Acts 15. And they say, and, and Barnabas goes, Hey, we're going to go on our missionary journey again. Let's bring Mark again. Paul goes, no way, no way. He abandoned us before that's not happening. Paul is serious about people following through and faithfulness in this situation. But it got so contentious that Barnabas and Paul split and Barnabas went with Mark and then Paul went with Silas and they started going their ways. And we think, Oh man, that stinks. And so what was ironic here? is that Demas began well, but didn't finish well. But what do we see here is that Mark, the guy who liked to scramble and run away when he was young, he grew up. God grew him up in the Lord and he was useful in the gospel. Let that be an encouragement to us this morning. Amen. What we, what we have been and what God wants to do with us. Amen. Amen. So work of the Lord in, in John Mark's life, his name was John Mark. And, and who is it that Paul requests that Timothy bring with him at the end of his life? Bring John Mark, bring John Mark. That's pretty cool. Mark matured there into a useful, faithful man of God. What an encouragement. And by the way, more verse 12, Tychicus, more baby names. I have sent to, <laughs> I've sent to Ephesus. You know, we don't know much about him, but he was a servant of the Lord, according to Romans 12, seven. So there are many faithful believers there that are being sent out in spite of all the opposition, in spite of all the pressure of, all, of in spite of all the people that abandoned Paul, but they were sent, they were sent, uh, 
to these areas in Asia Minor where people had abandoned him. Now, verse 13, he says, when you come to me, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus, another great name, at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. As we're going to see in a second, it appears that Paul was arrested in a violent way in Troas, so much so that all his belongings he wasn't able to bring with him. His, in, in his book, his bron- belongings are simply a cloak. And this would have been a heavy wool thing. You know, it's not like you had a lot of, when you're on the road, you just bring your, your jacket slash blanket with you, right? So your cloak, that would have been a heavy coat there. And then your books, these would most likely be the scrolls, maybe of scripture and all these things. And then the parchments this is above all the parchments. What do you think the parchments were? Right. He wants to be able to write to the churches and write letters to people. Paul wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books that we have 13 of the 27. It's just amazing. And so the practical tools of Paul, a coat books and paper to write to the churches and starting in verse 14, it seemed Paul ex- seen, he explains to us why he was without this stuff. Alexander, the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself for he strongly opposed our message. And so there was a coppersmith named, uh, named Alexander in Troas. Okay. And if you remember back in Acts 19 in Ephesus, there was a riot by a silversmith named Demetrius. And what had happened is Paul had been proclaiming the gospel And what happens is when you proclaim the gospel and people to come to Christ, they repent, they turn from their sins. And so when they were turning from their sins, they were turning from their idols. They're turning from all their books about all the nasty stuff and all this stuff. They started to follow the Lord. They had book burnings. I know not the good kind of book burnings where they're getting rid of trash, right? The, the, The horrible sin in their life. And that's what was going on. Well, it started cutting into the profit of the silversmiths who were making all the idols in this guy, Demetrius and the guild. They started riling up the people and it got to this huge riot against Paul. And they were screaming great is Artemis of the Ephesians for like four hours straight shaking the stadium type of a thing. And Paul had to leave town. That's what happened basically at the end of there. It's speculation, but it's probably happening the same thing in Troas. This coppersmith who probably made idols, this is again, probably was vehemently opposing Paul, which was strongly opposing, uh, which was manifested in persecution and also arresting Paul at the hands of this guy named Alexander. And we see that Paul, what does he do when he's faced with this kind of opposition? He doesn't get vigilante. He doesn't go out in arms. What does he say? I'm going to let the Lord deal with you. He'll judge you according to what you've done. I'm going to put it in his, his hands. Keep that in your mind in these times we live in. But he warned Timothy about Alexander as he was going through Troas. Paul says, man, be careful as you're going through to get my stuff. Stay away from that guy. He'll have your number. And Paul says what happened to him, of what happened to him in Troas in verse 16. He says, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me. But all deserted me, and may it not be charged against them. If you remember back in chapter one, Paul says, Everybody in Asia has deserted me. And what I think he's talking about is here. When I was in Troas, the church was silent. All the leaders were silent when I got arrested. No one came to my side. Everyone abandoned me. What does Paul say to them? May it not be charged against them. Like Stephen, you know, there was a lot of heavy things going on. This isn't to excuse their inaction, but what was going on was Nero was killing people. There was this persecution in Rome and Paul, even from a a temporal understanding, understood their fear probably. But these men who were supposed to be men of faith were operating in fear, not in faith. They were not standing up for righteousness. They were acquiescing to the situation, <laughs> except for one Onesif- uh, uh, one Sephorus. I'll just say that. that's another great name. One Sephorus, he was the one who came at great danger to his own family, right? But regarding the rest, Paul says may not be charged against them. So 
some of these leaders were weak in the face of persecution. It probably means it wasn't a matter of salvation. It might have been, but rather maturity. And, you know, so we don't know if these leaders were really saved or not, but either way, Paul mercifully doesn't want it to be held against them. But the point is that he was alone. He was left alone in a very difficult circumstance. Anyone relate? Verse 17, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Listen, Jesus is faithful. Jesus was faithful to Paul to stand by him when no one else did. There are times in our lives when we're alone. Jesus is faithful to stand. And not only is he faithful to stand, he's faithful to strengthen. And he strengthens us because he has a call and a purpose on our lives as believers. And it is to do something. And with Paul, it was to go and preach to the Gentiles that they might hear it. Back in Acts 9, 15 through 16, Ananias, uh, Ananias or whatever his name was. Yeah, I think, yeah, Ananias. He was a guy who was in um, Damascus and Paul had just got converted on the road. and, and, And everybody knew of Paul, Saul, who was persecuting the church. Well, he tells Ananias, go talk to Paul. He's like, ah, you know, Lord, have you thought this over, right? You know, one of those conversations that don't go well. But verse 15 says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So in this calling, there's built in suffering and he is a chosen vessel. And while Paul was suffering for the sake of his name, Jesus was faithful to stand by that, which to he is what he has called him. God will stand next to you as you fulfill the call that God has on your life. He will strengthen you. He will stand by you and he will empower you to do what he has called you to do. Amen. Verse 17, and so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. And this is just imagery back to the Daniel with the lion's den. Paul was in physical danger of dying, but what happened? The Lord rescued him out of mortal danger. Verse 18, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul's road was filled with suffering. This does not mean... If someone preaches to you that your Christian walk is going to be easy, walk away from that person. That's not the truth. You will suffer if you're going to follow the Lord. If you're going to follow in righteousness, those things will happen. You will be swimming upstream. And by the way, you will have tons of evil by the nature of your association with the Lord uh, thrown upon you. But what Paul says here is he's not expecting, you know, total deliverance in this world. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. In other words, he will sustain me in what he has called me to do. And when he's done doing that, he's going to bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. It's going to be hard, but God will be faithful. And when it's all done, and when my head is removed from my body, which he's expecting shortly, guess what's going to happen? glory. And he turns away from worship. This is his, what he's talking about as he's in a dungeon, everybody. He turns around and he goes to him, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He does this doxology. He's worshiping from the pit. Isn't that awesome? You too can worship today from whatever circumstance you're in. Put your eyes on Jesus who will rescue you. And he will bring you safely into his kingdom. And now that was kind of his final words there. And now he does his final signing off to the church. He says, Hey, greet Prisca, Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onsephorus. Again, great names. Um, The husband and wife Prisca and Aquila uh, who had the church gather in their homes. They were in various places 
They were a husband and wife ministry team. Apollos, who was awesome orator, but he didn't really know the things of the Lord very deeply in certain ways. And so they came alongside of him and taught him the ways of the Lord more completely. A husband, wife coming alongside and ministering to this man. And he did great things that God used him in the church. And so that was sweet. They had the church gathering in their house constantly, wherever they were. And so they were just a blessing behind the scenes. And so first off, he says, hey, greet them. They're obviously in Ephesus, I think. And the household of one Sephorus, who is basically the, the guy who came and ministered to him when no one else would. And then verse 20, Erastus remained at Corinth. He's just given Paul an update. Erastus is in Corinth and I left Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. Wait a second. Paul has the gift of healing. What's he doing here? Did he miss someone? Someone sick on your team? Why didn't he heal him? Paul not thinking of others again. <clears throat> Some say that the gifts are done. I don't believe that. That's not where I stand on this. But if you stand with there, I, uh, that's okay. But I think the Holy Spirit gives gifts as he says he's fit. And they're gifts that are used for his purposes and his glory. And quite often those purposes are lined up with the furtherance of his gospel. We just see that in the New Testament. And so for some reason, and I don't know why I'm not God, it was not God's will for Paul to be able to heal Trophimus. And he suffered there. Now Trophimus was one of those young men who was with Timothy when they went to Acts, went to Acts. That's great. Went to Jerusalem in Acts and they were Gentiles going into a Jewish situation. That's what caused this big riot. And Paul got arrested and that began his journey to Rome the first time. And so this is someone who went along with Paul and did things. And yet he didn't heal him. That's really interesting. So the gifts are used at the discretion of the one giving the gifts for his purposes. Amen. And uh, Paul concludes in verse 21. He says, do your best to come to me before winter. I don't think it's just because of the coat, but I think it's because of he's going to, he's going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be some, bad things coming on the horizon. And also you can't travel during winter. And, uh, Ubula sends his, uh, greetings to you. And so does, so do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. And so these are people that they would have all known brothers and a sister there in the church. And they just say hello to everyone. And they're saying hello to you. The church loves one another. And so Paul signs off in verse 22. He says, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. You know, Paul's final sign off there, that the Lord would be with their spirit, right? And he committed them to the grace of God. And that's just, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Paul said there, he's, he said, in, he says, I've completed the race. I've finished the fight. I'm, I've done the good fight. I'm, I'm done. It's time for the next generation to, to step up. God's called you to his side for his purposes in this time by the grace of God lean into him follow him obey him cast aside every weight the things that so easily ensnare us he created you for him for his joy and it's in him that you find your purpose in life, that you find what he's called you and made you to specifically be. And like we said before, the deceitfulness of the love of the world, love God first and let him sort out all the secondaries. He'll teach you how to love right. Amen. Just think of Paul's life. He wrote Romans, he wrote 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Think of how enriched we are in our lives because of that man's faithfulness. That's amazing. And we know that the reason that he was faithful is because of the one who was faithful, who called him. So all glory to God, right? That's what Paul would say. But what God would do through you, 
Who knows? You might be sitting there going, well, I'm like 80. Well, Moses, Mosetta, let's go. You know what I'm saying? God, you, it's not about all that. It's about him. Use it in an empty, broken, willing vessel. He's not into the, all the fully refined. Let him refine you. Empty vessel. Broken vessel. It says, Lord, here am I. You know, I think of uh, Isaiah chapter six. I was finished with that. I know I read it again, but last week. Did I read it last week? I'll just read it to you. It says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe was filled. It filled the temple and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings with two. He covered his faith with two. He covered his feet with two. He flew and one called to another and said, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Isaiah is pulled into the throne room of God. And the foundations of the threshold shook and the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And so you've got this glorious glassy sea with the throne sitting on it with these angels crying out, holy, holy, and everything is shaking. And the king of glory is on his throne and his glory fills the temple. And Isaiah says, woe is me for I'm lost. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among the midst of people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Translated New Testament. I'm undone. You are holy. I've got issues. There's nothing I can do. And then one of the, well, and then I heard, well, it says, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having hands in his hands, a burning coal that had been taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for a picture of the cross. This is what God does to a Paul, to a Timothy, to a Timothina, right? Jesus Christ takes away our sins. And then I heard a voice. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God's calling out to some of you today. Who's going to go for me? Who's going to, who's going to go? And then there's a response from Isaiah says, here I am, send me. This is what God desires to do. He cleanses you and he calls you and he empowers you and he sends you to do his will. And then God said, he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. I'm going to send you to people that's not going to listen. It's going to be easy and wonderful. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and bind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and they hear with their ears and they understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until the sea lies with late waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the land is desolate and waste. And he goes on, tell there's just nothing left. That's what I'm calling you to do, Isaiah. So it's time for us to seek God. It's time for us to call out to him again and say, What have I put? Number one, be my first love. And in your difficulties, know that he is faithful and stands by your side. Amen. Father, we come before you. And we want to thank you for this time through these pastoral epistles. We ask that you cleanse our hearts, God. You'd be number one. And not number one in attendance, Lord, only, but in life and in action and motive and attitude. So we surrender to you once again, Lord, as your church. And if there's someone in here who has not given their heart to Jesus, call out to him now as the spirit pulls you. Put your trust in the one who died and rose again for you to have total forgiveness and have new life. Cry out to God and ask for him to cleanse you, forgive you and give you new life. He'll be faithful. And so Lord, we come to you. Thank you for drawing us. 
be honored, be worshiped. All glory and honor to you. May many people come to know you. And may many people see you alive through us. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you this week. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Take care.